I want to give you guys three shaders to add to your game dev tool belt. If you're new to shaders, this video will be perfect for you because each one will teach you something different. Even if you have some experience with shaders, you'll like these because they all have practical applications. Ready? Let's go. The first one actually stems from a question on my Discord server, and I was so happy with the end result that I wanted to share it here on my channel. I know there are a lot of 2D devs out there that want to figure out how to replicate the look of Hollow Knight, specifically how to replicate the way they did lighting. And you could use Unity's 2D light features to do this. They are extremely robust, and I made a video showing how to utilize some of its more complex features if you want to check that out. But 2D lights do come with some overhead, and for something simple like this, they are not needed. We can just use a shader instead. So let's create a new sprite unlit shader graph, and I'll call it fake light. So as with most sprite shaders, start by creating a texture 2D and we'll call it main text. Doing this ensures that our shader automatically grabs the texture from our sprite renderer component. I'm going to assign just a random texture to that for now, just so that we at least have some visual component and sample it out so that we can actually see it. And actually go ahead and plug in the RGBA or in other words, the color because all the work we need to do is on the alpha side. And what we're actually going to do with this is turn this into a material that sits on a giant black sprite that covers everything on the screen. So we need this shader to basically cut out a smooth gradient portion of that black sprite in order to give us our light effect. So we'll be subtracting something from our alpha. Now we want a nice circular gradient to do this. You could use a texture for that, but I'm going to cheat and use the polar coordinates node which is this weird circular UV node. So if we split this to give us RGB and A separately, if we preview the R channel, we get a nice circular gradient, but it's backwards from what we want. We're subtracting something from our alpha here and black equals zero, which means it's subtracting nothing from the center, which is not what we want. So let's flip it with a one minus node. Now let's create a float called darkness strength and make it a slider between 0 and 200. To make this adjustable, we want to plug this into a power node. But when we do, we get this purple here, which means we've generated a value shader graph is not happy with. So first, we'll clamp our 1 minus node to ensure we only get values between 0 and 1, and then plug that into our power node. And we'll plug in our darkness strength here, And as you can see, that allows us to control how much black appears. And everything is working fine unless we enter a zero. So we'll clamp this result again to ensure that again, we only get clean values between zero and one and plug that into the subtract node and finally plug that into our alpha. Create a material using that shader by right clicking the shader and creating a new material. Now I'm going to add a massive black square as a child of our player and shoot up the order in layers so that it covers everything. And now if we give it our fake light material, we're able to control the area of light around our player. And if you want to adjust layers, like for example, maybe you only want the light to affect the background and not the foreground, again, just play around with the sorting layer and I'll make sure that my floor is higher than my shadow. And there you go. Number two is very basic, but this is likely the number one thing you need to understand about shaders. You can use this to make a surprising amount of textures and effects like water or rolling fog, for example. Create a shader called wave. And we're going to make a texture 2D called main text again and sample that out. And you can go ahead and plug in the base color and alpha straight away. And I've got this little wave texture here, so I'll plug that in. Okay, so we can get this to scroll by using a tiling and offset node. This is literally the number one node that you need to know about in shader graph. And to scroll this now, all we have to do is adjust the offset. And if you have problems at this point, save and close shader graph, because we want to make sure that our wrap mode in our sprite import settings are set to repeat, which they are not by default. So we'll change that 
and go back to our shader. And now you can see we're actually getting this thing scrolling. So to do that automatically, let's add a time node and create a float called scroll speed. I'll default it to one. So we'll multiply time by our scroll speed. And since this offset takes a vector two, let's plug this into a vector two on the X and plug that into our offset. So now I've got this wave sprite here and I'm going to create a material from that wave shader and insert it into our sprite. Now you might still be having issues like me here. The shader looked fine, but the wave is only showing inside of our actual wave shape here. So again, go into the import settings and change this from tight to full rect, which will fix it. And there you go. And number three, we're going to make a hit effect shader. So again, create a new shader. We'll create a main text, sample it out, and plug in just the alpha for right now. Now we need two other properties, a float called hit effect amount, and a color called hit effect color, and make sure that's HDR so that we can use Bloom if we want. So we are going to blend our texture color with our hit effect color. And the opacity of the blend will depend on our hit effect amount. And we don't want this to just overlay a new color. We want to completely overwrite it and plug that into the base color. I'll quickly set up a material and set it to my player. And I'd like to change this to a slider that goes between zero and one actually. Okay, and if we quickly add a global volume and make sure post-processing is turned on on our camera, we can add a nice glow to this as well. But the key to getting this to look good is not so much from the shader as it is with the code implementation. Let me show you real quick. Create a script called hit effect and add it to our player. Now my player has multiple sprites as children, so I'll have a little more work than you guys who are just using sprite sheets. So just some boilerplate stuff here. We'll set a duration for how long the flash will last. We'll get the shader property as an int because this is literally twice as fast as typing it in as a string. And we'll need to get a reference to all our sprite renderers like so. And from those, we can get our materials. So we'll set the materials to be the same length as our list of sprites and get all of the materials like so. So if you want to do this with a coroutine, you absolutely can, but don't follow along with this because this is just to demonstrate. So this will bring it to full color and this will bring it back to zero. And I'll say if my test key was pressed, then we'll start the coroutine. And you can see it's working, right? But with coroutines, if I press the key multiple times, it doesn't start over properly without even more setup with the code. Plus this is all hard coded and it interpolates from zero to full and full to zero linearly, which feels really flat. So I highly recommend a free tweening library like DoTween for this. Link is down below in the description. And let me show you how much better this is. So once it has been installed, we'll add the namespace at the top. And I'll add a float for my lerp amount as well. And I'm just gonna go ahead and get rid of all of this. So we do need to handle this as a getter and a setter. So for the getter, we'll just return our lerp amount. And for the setter, we'll set it to be the new value. Dotween looks for a getter and setter for the dotween.2 function. And actually, let's make sure that we return this to zero at the start every time. And now we plug in the getter and the setter. We're moving it to one. And length of time will be duration. OK, 
Okay, now we still need to actually change our material float. So set up a method called on lerp update, which loops through all our materials and moves the float to our get lerp value amount. And here we can add dot on update and plug in our on lerp update. Now we need this to go back to zero as well. So create a method called on lerp complete and we'll call our dotween.2, plug in the getter and setter, but we're moving it back to zero and duration again and call on lerp update here as well and add that as dot on complete here. And this should be on lerp update here. And now you can see way less code and it's already working, but it also will properly interrupt itself and start over if we press our button halfway through as well. That's one thing that I really love about this, but the other is the actual easing functions. If we go back in, this is linear by default, but if we add a dot set ease, now we have this huge range of easing options that we can choose from. And these are all pretty standard between different tweening libraries. You can Google an image of these. I want the start of our damage flash to get full quickly. So I'm going to set this to ease.outexpo. And there you go, that's much better. I just wanted to show you the best way to do this and coroutines can be a pain to manage and they just don't have as many options and it's also way more code to type out. So there you go guys, I hope you enjoyed. Let me know which shader was your favorite down below and I will see you again soon.